Hey everyone, and welcome to Module 6. This is where I talk about my process for writing copy. And because Module 5 was a pretty strategic, high-level module, what I wanted to do for you guys in this module is show you a little bit of the nitty-gritty. Show you kind of how I do things. Now, I'm not going to show you absolutely everything that I do for a piece because what we're talking about here is hypothetical. I'm not going to bring up one of my uh, one of my clients or anything like that. But what I will do is show you how I go through the individual phases of my writing process and how you can either model what I do or take some of what I do and apply it to your own workflow. And hopefully this is going to be a good module for you guys. But if you have questions on anything that I do or in more detail, make sure to uh, jump onto the Q&A calls and ask me whatever you need. So. My workflow, the way that I approach writing copy, especially when it comes to writing big projects, is four phases. The first phase is research. The second phase is the product itself. The third phase is the writing phase. And the fourth phase is the revision phase. So what I'm going to go through here is show you what the different parts of each phase are, how I go through them, and kind of how I organize my thoughts. So let's dive in here. This is going to be a little bit back and forth, so you might see me typing stuff in. It's not going to be super polished, and I apologize, but the content here is really good. So let me know if you have any questions in the Q&A, but let's get right started. All right, so phase one, research. The most important part of any copywriting project, period. This is where you make or break the success of the project. So the first thing you want to do is start looking for information on your target market. Target market, like we talked about in previous videos, is the demographic information and the psychographic information for the type of prospect that you are targeting. Now, there's two ways to figure out who your target market is so you can start doing research on them. The first one, ideally, if you're working with clients, is you get their ideal client from you, from your client or their ideal customer. So what you do with that is approach your client and ask them questions related to their best customers. Now, if you're dealing with someone who hasn't had any customers, then obviously you're not gonna be able to do this. You'll have to skip to the second part. But if, you're, if your client has customers and has good ones versus bad ones, they're likely gonna have a lot of information on who the best ones are, what they do, why they do the things they do, what their motivations are, everything like that. You wanna start asking those questions. So when you talk to your client, make sure that's part of one of the questions you ask, either in the initial meeting after you've gotten the first payment or in the initial questionnaire they fill out to become a client, whatever it happens to be. Ask them who their ideal clients are, their ideal prospects, their ideal customers, and get as much information from them as you can because you're going to use that to jump off and do your own research. Remember, you can trust what your client says, but you have to verify what they say. You have to figure out if what they're saying is true, how true it is, like if it has anything changed, all that kind of stuff. It's your job as a copywriter to catch those flaws, but you have a really great place to start if you start with what your clients already know. Now, let's assume for whatever reason, either a client doesn't know, he doesn't have any data, or she doesn't have any data, whatever it is, uh, you do not have a way to immediately pick a target market for your product or whatever piece that you're writing. Here's how I would go about finding the right buyer for the piece that you're writing. First things first, you want to figure out what you're actually writing for, whether the product is a physical product. If, if it's a physical product, what industry it is, is it in? What niche is it in? Uh, what uh, type of buyers have bought that product before, things like that. If it's an information product, same thing. What industry? What niche? Where is it? Like, is it a uh, big physical product? Is it a small physical product? Is it a business-to-consumer facing product? Is it a business-to-business -business facing product? What is it? Find out what you're trying to sell. That's going to help frame where you look. So, for instance, if you're trying to sell, you know, God forbid, something like a aircraft turbine to aircraft manufacturers or aircraft uh, parts people, then you're probably not going to look at Amazon for any sort of you know buyer information on that particular piece. Now, model airplanes maybe, but definitely not big B2B parts. So take all of these resources that I talk about in just a second and apply them to whatever type of product that you are trying to find the target market for. <clears throat> the first one is obvious. So we're going to look at Amazon. Now, Amazon is, they call it the everything store. It's really the everything for consumer store. 
So we've got different departments here, and I'll zoom in so that you can see them. Um, so we've got the different departments in Amazon, like video, uh, Prime Music, their Android apps and different types of apps for their Kindle Fire, uh, photos, Kindle uh, type stuff, and then we go into books, obviously that's where it started, movies, music, and games, electronics, home garden and tools, beauty and health, toys, clothes, sports, automotive, and then all the way down here to handmade stuff and home services. So here on Amazon, you have a wealth of different types of products that you can start researching for. And as you come over here, you can obviously see the different types and there's, there's all broken down into categories. So the odds are, if you are selling some sort of consumer product, it's going to be on Amazon or the competitors for that product are going to be on Amazon. Now, let's just say, let's find something really simple. Let's look at a... Uh, furniture piece and we're shopping by room and I'm just doing this randomly we're gonna shop by bedroom and we're gonna grab some decorative pillows all right so we're selling decorative pillows now 555 reviews on this cotton linen square decorative throw 466 reviews for this American textile zippered body pillow you can see here that if you are selling you know pillows with pictures of dogs on them, perhaps you should go look at this Fantascope dog series cotton pillow and see what people have to say about it. And so let's go down here. Let's see what's going on. Pug, um, you know, it says things about the pug. It's got a picture of a pug. It's got several images and showing the different sizes, different relative. Oh, and look, they have multiple dogs. So now we're starting to get a feel for the type of product here. Now who buys it? Let's figure that out. We go down here to reviews. Uh, as we scroll down, looks like 95, 96% of people have five stars, so that's not a bad pillow. Um, but now we can start looking at, let's, some, let's look at some three-star reviews. I got this as a gift. Uh, I was thinking it'd be a fully-fledged pillow, but it's only a pillow case, and we had to go find a pillow for it. Oh, interesting. Okay. So now we start looking at the different types of buyers and some of the different problems that they have, some of the, um, some of the questions they might have around things. Let's go to five star only, and we're looking for uh, what are these, you know, verified purchases right here. So somebody who bought a pillow, they act, they bought one, they bought a couple. Who knows what they did? She loves dogs. Uh, she has a very cute pug. Obviously, this is a pretty easy one. We go down here, we look for the verified purchase, and we start looking at what these buyers who have given five stars to this product think. And now we start to realize, okay, these are buyers for the product I'm trying to promote. And this is what they think. This is who they are. We might be able to click on their profile. Let's see what Crystal says. Okay, Crystal likes pugs, or this is what, a French French poodle, French bulldog, something like that. And we're gonna look at here, Crystal. Uh, she's a homebody. She loves to cook, bake, garden, can, crochet, and many other crafts. She loves to draw and paint. She has three little dogs. Do you know a lot about Crystal now? And now you know that she's a buyer of the pillow that you're selling. You know kind of who buys this stuff and what they look like. She lives in Washington, in Bonnie Lake, Washington. She's a shop coordinator. I don't even know what that means. And you can even send her an email, which is super interesting. I can pop up her email right here and send Crystal specifically an email to ask her questions if you want to. That is something I just learned myself. But what we're looking at here is a wealth of buyer information about your product. And it applies everywhere. You want to go to car electronics? You want to figure out stuff? <laughs> Talk about a niche where people buy a lot of stuff, right? Let's look at car audio. Let's look at different pieces for car audio, whatever this crazy contraption, how looking thing is. This is $100, 2,679 customer reviews with a thousand plus answered questions. You have a wealth of buyer information here and truly buyer information. All you have to go down here and figure out is, you know, who are the verified purchasers and why did they purchase? And if they are a verified purchaser, why would they give this thing three stars? Um, why would they, uh, okay, this one doesn't say verified purchase, but it has a huge review. What are some of the issues? What, what, what do they think is really important? They've included pictures here. So do not underestimate Amazon 
as a re as a research tool as much as it is a place to go buy stuff. It, it, all the information is right here for you guys. And if you're looking for specifically for buyers, for consumer facing products, Amazon is an absolutely wonderful place to start. And oftentimes you really don't need to go too much further than Amazon. Now, let's talk about some stuff that maybe Amazon doesn't have uh, in its repertoire. We're talking local businesses, professional services. Uh, we're talking about business to business stuff, international stuff in a lot of cases. Um, Amazon's still huge all around the world, but in some countries it's not as big as it is in the United States. So let's look at some other options. Let's say you're marketing to a local market or you're doing some sort of copywriting for a local business. Where do you go to find buyers to, to understand your target market for the local business? The best place that I can think of to go that already has built-in reviews is Yelp. Obviously there are other review sites. You can go to other review sites for local businesses um, and look at what people are saying, but Yelp is the biggest one. So if I want to find, let's uh, talk about bars in uh, bars near Denver, Colorado, and hit search. So let's look for bars. Let's look at what we got here. We've got different types of bars. So if you're marketing for a client who has a really expensive bar, click on this button, see what people are saying about it. 424 reviews. 83 reviews, 208 reviews, 39 reviews, 113 reviews, 349 reviews. These are all buyers. Someone who very, very rarely does somebody go not go to a restaurant and then write a review on that restaurant. So you're looking at buyers for these bars. Same thing with, it doesn't have to just be local businesses like bars and restaurants and coffee shops and things like that. You can look at attorneys. You can look at real estate agents. So if I type in attorney near Denver, Colorado, what pops up? We've got ads. Okay, so you know who's advertising. You've got uh, Bowman and Chamberlain, 37 reviews, 15 reviews, 8 reviews, 8 reviews, 5 reviews, 3 reviews, 6 reviews, 5 reviews. All of these attorneys have reviews on their performance. These are 5 stars, but now we can, we can look through filters and say, okay, uh, highest rated, um, most reviewed, different types of neighborhoods, the distance that you have here. If you're doing anything in local, go to Yelp and find out who your target market is, who your buyers are. These are people who bought or have active are actively buying some sort of thing like that and you're looking at what they have to say rather than some random opinion on some random you know, Facebook group or something like that. There's a time and place, but first and foremost, Look for existing buyers. If your product is so new and so strange that there is no other product like it on the market at all, then go to the nearest competitor. Go to the nearest thing that it's like. And if there isn't one of those, then you probably shouldn't be selling it because, to be quite honest, if you can't compare it to something, people are going to have a really hard time using it. You can try but if you have no idea who to target, you're just going to be shooting in the dark and you might as well just wish yourself luck. So that is how you find buyers for your target market. And then you start doing all the research, the target market. Who are they? Their demographics, their psychographics. Where do they live? What age are they? What sex are they? Are they married? Are they single? Are they divorced? Do they have kids? How old are the kids? Where do they live? How much is their house? That's all demographic information. Psychographic information. What do they like to read? Who do they like to listen to? Who do they hate? Who do they absolutely ignore? All those types of questions. Figure that out once you've figured out who the buyers are. That's my advice. Now, let's look at some stuff. What because I've this is business to consumer, but for local businesses. Amazon is business to consumer for basically all products that you can sell to consumers. Let's look at some business to business. You can type in the Better Business Bureau and we'll find their website. The Better Business Bureau, the BBB, is an organization where you can find a business based on their name or their state or uh, anything or charities, business and charities, things like that. Um, and you can also search by category. So let's look up uh, industrial trucks. Industrial trucks. Uh, let's let's just go with Colorado for now uh, because that's where I am. But you know what, Colorado works. Okay, BB, uh, are they accredited? No, how far away are they? Mile high trucking. 
read their report on this business, file a complaint, submit a customer review. So we're starting to look at these businesses who handle industrial trucking and we can read the Better Business Bureau's report on these businesses. Now, it may or may not be a huge one, but look, these guys have an A+. They're not accredited yet, but they have an A-plus rating. There's no complaints against them, but you can start looking at some of the information on this business and start seeing what is valuable to the people seeking information on them. Uh, what is, you know, their, who's in charge of them? There's their business manager right there. You know, the person in charge of that business if you needed to contact them. So this type of information helps you if you're in a business to business market and the Better Business Bureau is a great place to start because they basically run all businesses. So if you're business to business in America, this would be a great place to start. Internationally, I'm not sure what the equivalent of Better Business Bureau is, but I'm sure that every major country has their equivalent and you just need to go find it. So that is for business to business specifically. Now we can start looking at some of these sites that maybe have some bad reviews on them, like Consumer Reports. Consumer Report is an organization where you can type in a specific type of product and get specific product reviews from buyers who are interested in anything from air conditioners to laptops, generators, and everything in between, EpiPins, all of it. This is a wealth of information for you guys to go look and try and find out who the buyers are in your marketplace and then figure out what their demographics and psychographics are. Remember, don't do research on people who aren't buyers. It's no point, you're not getting anywhere. Go find who the buyers are, the people actually spending money. Ignore the angry people on Facebook, ignore the angry people on YouTube. Go find the buyers. I'll take a sip of my coffee here. Now, last thing, or no, two more things actually. So when you're looking at target market, research and you're trying to find demographic and psychographic information. I've showed you some ways to do that in the previous uh, Q&A calls and in the first module when we talked about target market. But there's two ways that are sort of, um, you could call them hacks. A lot of people know about them. A lot of people know about one of them. A lot of people don't know about the other one. So let's talk about the one that people know which is Audience Insights. It's an underutilized tool that Facebook has that basically shows you what the demographic and psychographic information is on the audiences that use Facebook. Now this is audiences that use Facebook. Uh, you can target almost anyone, especially in the United States with Facebook. It's mostly good for business to consumer, although many different types of business to business offers are also relevant on Facebook. If you're targeting solopreneurs, business owners, um, professional services, things like that, then Facebook is also a great place to look. If you're trying to target industrial parts or trucking, maybe not the best place, although it could still slightly be relevant. So what we're looking at here for target market research is we can type in by interests, business and industry, if we're looking at you know different types here where you can dig down into banking or uh, whatever type it is, you can dig down into all of these different interests or you can type in a specific interest like Frank Kern. You know, if I type in Frank Kern and I'm looking at everybody in the United States between the ages of 18 and anyone who likes Frank Kern and is active around Frank Kern, there's about 400 to 450,000 people monthly active. 65% of them are men, 36% of them are women, and the vast majority of the men are in between the age of 25 and 44. The vast majority of women are between the ages of 35 and 54. Interesting information here that you can learn. Now let's dig down into women. If we look at just 100% woman audience, you see obviously the age breakdowns are there. Now 150 to 200,000 because it's a smaller audience. If we look at their page likes, we can look at it's interesting because it seems as though there is a trend towards African Americans or the uh, that type of culture, at least, or that type of interest in the uh, large demographics of women who like Frank Kern. So uh, preachers on oxygen, uh, Braxton Family Values, BlackDoctor.org, BlackHairInformation.com, Essence, Brown Girl Collective, Sophisticates Black Hairstyles and Care Guide, Real Housewives of Atlanta fan site. So you can see that there's a definite shift. And look, they buy hair vitamins. They read Essence. They read Sister to Sister. They like these, these people. That's incredibly important information to realize that if you're trying to target women who like Frank Kern, 
they most likely have some sort of African-American bent to them. Now, you can't search by specific demographics. Like, you can't go down here and only search by African-Americans. But you can see that of the 150 to 200,000 monthly active people, this is what they all tend to like. And that's really interesting information for you to gather when you're looking at demographic and psychographic information. Now, I'm sure you guys can see how powerful this can be when you're looking at interests. But like I said before, you want to focus on buyers. You don't want to focus on just anyone. So how do we find buyers on Facebook? This is something that not a lot of people are super aware of. And you got to keep in mind that Facebook buys a lot of their data from third parties. And so the data might be out of date to a certain extent. You know, they only buy it every quarter or so or whatever, however often they tend to buy the updated statistics. But we can still go in here and get some really interesting information. So we took away Frank Kern and we've got, you know, 100 to 150 million active women in the United States. Let's look, go with all 200, 250 million active people, demographics, boom. Now let's go down here and when you first get here, you're just going to see this advanced tab. Click on the advanced tab, go down to behaviors, click on behavior and start looking at some of the behaviors you can click on. Charitable donations, are those buyers? Absolutely. All charitable, animal welfare, arts and culture, cancer causes, children's causes, environmental and wildlife, health, political, religious, veterans, world relief. If you want to sell financial advice or like Stansberry Research, why not target political behavior? Charitable donations to political parties, specifically Republicans, if you can target them, which I believe you can. I'd have to dig down in here and that's not the focus of this video. But religious, veterans, rural relief, all these different donations, charity is a buyer. They send money. So keep that in mind when you're looking at all this stuff. Consumer classification. In this case, they don't have that much uh, information. They only have what they bought from India, whether or not they have an affinity for mid to high value goods in India. So it's not that valuable with consumer classification, although this could eventually get built out even better, so keep an eye on it. Digital activities, this one's huge. Do they use Facebook payments? That's incredible. Facebook page admins, if you're targeting local, uh, social media managers, local businesses, things like that. Internet browser used, primary email domain, technology late adopters or early adopters, small business owners. So these are, again, data that they buy, keep in mind but very, very powerful targeting tools. Now, that's just some of the cool stuff on Facebook when you're doing your research. Let's go down here to purchase behavior. You are looking for buyers. Facebook bought a list of buyers from the biggest data gatherers, the three biggest data gatherers in the United States. Go down here, go to business purchases, business marketing or maintenance, repair and operations, buyer profiles, green living. This one's not built out, but again, keep an eye on it. Clothing. Men's, seasonal, women's, men's what? Accessories, business apparel. Okay, great. Health and beauty, beauty products and accessories, kids products, baby, baby toys, children's products. All down the line, pet, purchase habits. Are they above average? Yeah, click on that, absolutely. Let's look at what above average purchase behavior people look like. 15 to 20 million active people, 61% of them are women and the majority of them are over the age 45. If that doesn't get you excited, then you should uh, check your pulse. Established elite, luxury buyers, summit estate, platinum oldies, corporate clout. These are people, baby boomers, who are spending the money that they earned during their lives and spending it on themselves. So this is incredible information, especially on Facebook. 58 or 76% of them are still married. That's a big deal. Okay. Um, 14% of them total have gone to grad school, which is 68% above the normal Facebook numbers. 64% of them have gone to college. They're highly educated. They work in legal education, science, healthcare, nursing, all that kind of stuff. This is a wealth of information. What pages do they like? Pottery Barn, Pier 1, Loft, Chico, Shutterfly, <laughs> Republican stuff. If this isn't getting you guys excited about looking into the demographic and psychographic information on what your market is doing, I don't know what is. So Facebook has a wealth of information for you just sitting there for your research. Use it. You have not just behaviors, but everything around here. 
market segments, home, financial, work, education, just use it. Dig in here and play with it, especially on your next project. So that is the Facebook audience insight. And that's the one that most people know about, but not a lot of people spend a lot of time digging around in. Now, let me tell you about kind of what I do for uh, some sneaky research, especially for information projects in general. Let's say you're doing a uh, product launch or some sort of package for an information marketer and your information marketer, your client has competitors. Now, who do you think the buyers are for your client's project? Probably the same people who bought your competitor's products, especially in information. People never just buy one piece of information. So how can you find the best buyer profile for your client by looking at your competitor's stuff. The easiest way to do that is to go find testimonials that are on the competitor's page. Let's go see if we can find one real quick. And if I can't find one quickly, then uh, we won't use it. However, think about that for a second. If you can, if you can find a competitive product that is almost the same or selling the same thing that your client is, and you can go to it and, and you can find where the, uh, it won't let me click on the YouTube link right here, unfortunately. So it won't let me fast forward through this. Contact disclaimer affiliates. Let's look at affiliates right here. Let's see if they've got testimonials. Uh, that's for affiliate information only. So, I'm going to close that, yes. And, but you can see where I'm, right here I'm logged into my ClickBank account. Um, I don't promote any ClickBank's account, uh, ClickBank products myself, I just go in here for research purposes. But all I do is I click on find products and I hit the enter button because that gives me the top stuff based on popularity. And then I go here and I start seeing the most popular VSLs, 150,000 people like this thing. And normally I can, I can go in here and hack my way through and perhaps I can um, copy the video URL, come over here, paste it, see what's going on with YouTube. All right, great. Now I'm in here on YouTube. Now keep, <laughs> sorry, this is going a little fast for you guys, but now I'm in here on YouTube and I can skip to the end and I can start looking for testimonials. Start, start looking for testimonials of this. We're looking for testimonials. What do they say? What do they say? What do they say? What do they say? All right, well, I can't find any testimonials immediately on this VSL. However, you should be able to find them pretty quickly if you spend a little bit of time looking at this thing. And if you want to sit here on the page and wait for it to pop, then usually, even if I come up here to the X button and I hit X and it says, okay, I'll stay here and I'll go to the regular sales page. So I'll click a bit out of this one right here. Go to the regular sales page. Let's see what, <laughs> interesting. All right, this one in particular does not have any testimonials. However, most of them do. Testimonials are huge sellers. So when you look at this, you can typically find the testimonials at, that your client is looking, for, or that your uh, competitors have put up and then look and see what kind of person is giving that testimonial. This is assuming, obviously, that they didn't pay for the testimony or that they didn't fake the testimonial, so you gotta worry about those kinds of niches. But if it's a legitimate company, a legitimate competitor, their, their testimonials are real people, real buyers. And so you literally got a snapshot of what a perfect buyer looks like for your client's product. And then you can go into your demographic and psychographic research on that person. That's my little hack um, that you guys can use in order to start finding real buyers for your target market. Now, that was a lot of information and we're only on part one right here. You can tell that research is a big deal for me. Now, I'm not gonna go through and explain super deep on the primal desire, primal fear, core needs, market awareness, market sophistication. We've beat that horse to death. You know what those are at this point. If you don't know what they are, go back and watch the module that uh, I teach them the big four module and really understand them. Now, one thing that you need to do once you've done all your target market demographic and psychographic research and you've got all these things, write them down in order. 
you separate them into these parts if you need to. And then say, okay, so my target market is this. My target market is this type of person and who they believe. And then the primal desire that they're feeling is this. Their primal fear is this. Their core needs are being met like this. Their market awareness level is this. Now, one thing that I'll say that I might not have said clearly in any of the other previous training, you get to choose, for the most part, you get to choose what level of market awareness you are going to speak to. Because for most marketplaces, there are people at every level of market awareness. So if you're picking your target market, then you're effectively picking what the market awareness is for your piece. Because you know, by, based on your target market, how aware they are of your particular solution. So be aware of that. If you want to find a better prospect for, your, for either yours or your client's product, and they're trying to target someone who's way you know, market awareness level four or five, maybe you can bring them back to a market awareness level two by targeting a different type of person and telling them why you're doing it. That's incredibly powerful, and I've made my clients a significant amount of money by simply bringing back the market awareness and saying, hey, market to the people who already want your stuff. Don't try and go out and market to everyone. So focus on that. You can choose what your market awareness is through your target market. Now, what you can't choose is the market sophistication, and that's, so that's why you have to go through and figure out what your competitors are doing, what their headlines look like, how their funnels are working, everything like that. Write it down in order and make sure you understand it deeply. This is where you make or break your copy. The fifth part of the research phase, once you're done with all of that stuff, is to verify. So you've done all of this research, you've compiled all your stuff, you've got your primal desire, every, everything pulled together here. Now you have to verify it. Verifying can be a lot of different things. Either you go talk to your client and verify some of the research that you found with their personal experiences, if they know their market really well. You can interview some of your perfect uh, target market. You can actually talk to the people who you're about to sell to and ask them these questions and see if it matches with what you have here. You can talk to focus groups or look up focus group Research. A lot of companies have focus group research just sitting around because they like to talk about it. The research is out there, guys. It's everywhere. External research. You can go and you can find other people's surveys. You can find other people's uh, infographics, other people's research, and look and see if what they have compiled is similar to what you have compiled on your own. The reason I say to do this last is because you don't want to rely on other people's methods before you look at the market yourself. Relying on other people's research before you do the work yourself is a recipe for disaster because either A, their information is bad and it doesn't work, or B, it's outdated, meaning you have no idea when they actually did it and the market may have moved, or C, it's not specific to your target market. A lot of surveyors look for bigger numbers. They don't look for specific numbers. And so if you're looking at this information and it looks off to you, look and see who they talk to and why because you might find out that they're not actually talking to your target market. The last one is surveys. If you have the capability of doing this with your clients, definitely do it. Do the survey that we talked about in the big four module, the deep dive survey. Try and figure out what their uh, core pains are. That you know, The single most important question is what Ryan Levesque calls it, but you can refer to it as basically what their major pain is, what their, uh, what their major pain points are and the language they use to describe it. That deep dive survey is going to help you there. Any sort of survey data you can do on the list is beneficial. So definitely verify using one or all of these methods once you've done your initial four-part research. Let me know if that makes sense in the Q&A calls, but we're going to move on to step two. Oh, no we're not. We are going to explain when you're done with research. Now you have a ton of research here. Now when are you done? You're done when your buyer persona is complete. When you can, and here's, here's how I feel if my buyer persona is complete. If I feel like I can write a page out of my prospect's diary and they will not think that somebody else wrote it, then my buyer persona is complete. Dear diary, this is Susie. Today, I don't like how my legs look in the mirror. I feel super self-conscious because of the cellulite in them and I feel like everything I try to do is just not working. Even though I'm trying to diet or I'm trying to work out, it's just not working at all. 
I'm so tired of it. I want to find a reason why, and I want to fix it for good. Love, Susie. That's how you know when your buyer persona is complete. When you can write a page out of their diary and not know that, and they won't know that you wrote it for them. Next one is the competitive analysis. If you have the means, if you have the resources, and if your client has the resources, I would highly suggest looking up your top one to three competitors in your space and running through their marketing and cataloging everything. You want to find out how they're selling their stuff. You want to find out what their upsells are. You want to find out what their cross sales and down sales are. Sometimes this means buying through their product funnel, which is fine if you're, you know, if, if your client just paid you five figures to work on your copy project, then you can afford to spend $500 on your competitor's products because that competitive analysis is going to give you an edge to winning for your client. Now, don't do this for every single competitor. Do it for the, the top one, maybe the top three, and buy through their funnel and see what happens and catalog everything. Screen record if you have to, uh, but catalog the entire process and then keep track of their emails, the upsells that they offer, the cross-sells, everything like that, their price points, all of it. Do the competitive analysis that will help you when you're doing this market sophistication research. And finally, make sure that you are very, very clear on what your client's sales funnel is going to look like. Get crystal clear on exactly how you are going to write for that sales funnel. If your client says, I want to do a webinar funnel, then you say, great, how exactly is that going to look? Are you driving traffic from Facebook ads to a landing page for the webinar registration that is going to register them for the webinar and then you need three follow-up emails to remind them about the webinar and the webinar itself needs to be this and then after the webinar they're going to a sales page and that sales page is going to get hit by three other emails for the people who didn't attend. Like, Get granular, get specific. Because the last thing you want is two days before the deadline and your client comes to you and says, oh yeah, so uh, are the webinar slides done? When you didn't sign up to write the webinar slides and it's not in the contract anywhere. I had that exact same situation happen to me except it was in the contract that I was not doing the webinar slides and my client messed up and he freaked out and I managed to get an extra $6,000 out of that project because my client realized he had 20, he had 48 hours to finish the project and he didn't want to do it, so he let me do it. That's the power of understanding what these sales funnels, what the true architecture of the sales funnel is and that's when you know you're done with the research phase. Let's jump into phase two, the product. So if you are selling something for a client, then 99% of the time you will have a product that you are going to sell to the marketplace. Now, some clients are going to try to sell something that doesn't exist. If you're a really good copywriter and they have a really good idea of what they want to sell, then this can work, but I wouldn't suggest it when you're starting out, and here's why. The product is going to be your primary and sometimes only source for the vast majority of the actual copy that you're going to write. And here's how you break that down. First one is the initial product scrub. So this is when you have the product and you go through the entire product. Go through it quickly, skip through the videos, try and see what the main points are. If it's a book, if it's a book, go through the book, read the headlines, read, read the table of contents, read the front and back covers, read some of the chapter headers and the sub chapter headers and go through it, skim through it one or two times and just so you can understand the gist of the product. That's part one. If it's a video course, then go through the videos, skip through them, uh, 2x speed, 3x speed, whatever you got to do, just go through it very, very rapidly and get the main points out of the product so that you understand the full scope of the product that you're dealing with here. If it's a physical product, try to get your client to ship you. Actually, do not accept the project unless they're willing to ship you either the prototype or a physical version of the product itself because you want to have experience with the thing that you are selling. Now, that's the initial product scrub. Get in there. The next part is the deep dive into the product. Now, this is where you actually go through the entire product yourself using the outline that you built in part one, and you start writing down everything that you think is interesting or fascinating about that product, and or the features that are outlined, or some of the cool things they talk about. And this is the 
the nitty gritty. This is hard stuff because you're just going through the product, writing down everything you know, taking notes on the content, taking notes on some of the examples they use, yada, yada, yada. Deep dive into it and take as much information out of that product as you possibly can. That's going to become your features list in part three that you then turn into a fascination list of bullets and benefit lists and things like that that you can use in your copy and your videos or even in your ads or your headlines. Once you've gone through the deep dive of the product, you're going to have a list of features in this part in part three, and you get to start translating that into benefits. The features will translate into benefits, and the benefits will translate into fascinations. The features themselves are exactly what the product is giving you. The benefits are the reasons why those features are awesome, and the fascinations are the intriguing little tidbits that you can describe about the benefit. So how can you tease the promise? Maybe that's the promise itself, maybe it's a little tease, whatever it looks like. So if a feature is that there is a technique to uh, working out that will help you burn 62% more calories in every workout, that is, the, that is the feature, right? The technique itself is the feature. The benefit is it will help you burn 62% more calories in each workout. The fascination is you can take that and go, you will lose weight three times faster than most workouts. Three times faster because 62%, whatever, do some math. That's the fascination. This one technique will help you lose weight three times faster without working any harder than you are right now. That's a fascination bullet and it comes from a feature and the features come from deep diving into the product. Part four is when you're mining testimonials, reviews, stories, and results in advance from the product. Most of the time products will illustrate what they're talking about by giving an example or two. Those are your testimonials. Those are your reviews. Those are the stories you can use in the product itself. And those are things that you can use to demonstrate results in advance because the person wants to know that what they're buying is gonna solve their problem. And so if you can show them that it already solved the same problem, if it can answer an objection that you see coming up, then pull that out of the product because it will most likely, eight times out of 10, it will be there. So pull all those out in part four. And part five, once you're done with all four previous parts, then you're gonna have a really, really good idea of what the core promise, the core premise is here. And based off the previous module that you looked at for the big idea, you're gonna know how to take all of that information and succinctly say it in a way that really grasps the audience and uses that for the big idea. That is phase two. You can break down these phases into as much time or as little time as you want. Just keep in mind that the research phase is the most important, followed by the product phase, followed by the writing phase, followed by the revision phase. So phase two, product, do not skimp on this. Go through the product as deeply as you can. Phase three, there's only three parts to phase three, which is the writing phase. The first part is gather and organize. Right now you have a ton of information. You have a ton of research. You have a ton of notes, you have a ton of features, you have a ton of testimonials and all this kind of stuff. You have everything that you need. It's just scattered everywhere. So gather it and organize it. Put it together. You know you're going to need a headline. You know you're going to need a subhead. You know you're going to need an initial lead into the story. You know that you're going to need bullets. You know that you're going to need a value stack. You're gonna know that you know that you're going to need bonuses. You know that you're going to need testimonials. You know, you know that you're going to need a guarantee. All of these things that you know you need, you can gather and organize into a way that makes sense to you, whether it's note cards, whether it's a Google Doc or an Evernote, whatever it happens to be. Gather it however you work best. Put it in the order that you know you need for sales copy, which is any template anywhere. I don't need to give one to you because you can find it in two seconds on Google. And put them together in an organizational way that you don't miss anything, you don't lose anything. And then keep everything together as you're writing. The second part is what I personally do, and this is what I call the conversation. Because I have all of this information in my head, and I've got all this research at my fingertips. I imagine myself, and this is because I've written a ton of copy, so maybe, maybe you guys aren't as comfortable as doing this uh, as I am, but you will be eventually. You've already written a ton of copy given the, the amount of work that you've done on the daily assignments and weekly assignments, so you eventually get this comfortable as well. The conversation is when I imagine myself, like I said before in a couple modules, sitting down in a chair, 
pretending to be the author or the person who's speaking in the piece, and I'm talking with my ideal client in the chair next to me. That's the conversation. How do I get their attention? How do I get their interest? How do I get their desire to build in the product, and how do I get them to take action? That really simple AIDA format is how you flow that conversation because it's like you would do with any conversation that you were looking for them to take some sort of action on. Get their interest, get their attention. I'm sorry, get their attention first, get their interest, then get their desire building and then get them to take an action. That is the flow of the conversation. So I write out my entire conversation with them. I don't worry about you know, whether or not I have a headline or whether or not the story fits in the right place or whether or not the guarantee is in the right place or if I have any testimonials or whatever. I don't worry about that. First, this is my really, really rough draft. I write the conversation how I feel it would be most compelling to draw their attention, get their interest, build their desire, and then get them to take action. Once I've finished with that conversation, I let it sit for a little while, 24 to 48 hours, and then I go back through with an actual template, whatever template I'm deciding to use, whether it's my own or somebody else's, and I go through and I start rearranging stuff so that the narrative makes sense, I read it out loud to myself, and I templatize it so that I know I've got a headline, subhead, a guarantee, testimonials, you know, urgency, all the stuff that you're supposed to put into a good piece of sales copy, but first I want the core of the conversation. I want it to feel natural, and then you can use a template to shore that up in the after you've gone through the actual conversation. That's my process for writing, guys. You guys might have a different one. Maybe you want to do the conversation first and then gather a bunch of information and see how you can shore up what you've talked about and then do templates. Maybe you don't even want to do any of this and you write in a different way. It's up to you. This is my process, but it works for me really well. And it tends to give me copy that doesn't really sound like other copy. And that's a really good thing when you're doing in competitive markets. Phase four, revisions. Revisions are four parts, and the reason I have a question mark next to client feedback is because sometimes your clients do not know how to give good feedback. If you're dealing with a client who's not very versed in direct response or they're just not familiar with it, then I wouldn't really trust their feedback. But if you're working with a client who does know it, then absolutely trust their feedback. It helps to have the person who created the product or is the expert on the product go through your copy and say, ah, oh, that doesn't make sense, or oh, that's not exactly true, or oh, that claims a little bit much, or whatever it happens to be. Go through it as partners. Do not let them just mark the crap up and accept what they say unless you truly, truly value their experience because you're the copywriter and they're the product owner. So own what you've given them, but accept the feedback that they can give you if it's going to be valuable to get the end result, which is more sales. Part two, 48 hour rule. I talked about this briefly in part three, or I'm sorry, phase three, but the 48 hour rule is basically where I take 24 to 48 hours and I don't look at the copy because if you can come back to it with fresh eyes and fresh mind, you're going to see things that you missed. You're going to see how some of the stories you brought up are a little bit much, maybe a little campy, whatever. Like you get a little emotional after you've gotten into this research coma and then started splurging everything else on the page. So the 48 hour rule is designed so that you can cool down and really go through what you need to do, especially when you're looking at it with a template. And that's, that's how I structure my writing and I make sure that I'm not over the top with any of the stuff that I write. Part three is that data is king. One of the things you want, like we talked about in previous modules, that you want to figure out is what the metrics of success are for this piece. Is it clicks? Is it purchases? Is it applications? Is it downloads? Whatever it happens to be, what are the metrics of success? What are you looking to hit? And through revisions, you only want to go through a certain amount of revisions before you start looking at the data. If your client and you are going back and forth and changing little words and not actually driving traffic, then it's time to start driving traffic because data is king. The little stuff doesn't matter. I had a client who sent a piece back to me three times. Uh, this was not a savvy direct marketing client, so that was part of my problem, but she sent the piece back to me three times because she didn't like one of the words that I used in one of the paragraphs. That was it. No other changes. So make sure that you're Make sure that your clients understand that the data that you get on the piece from actual traffic is the measurement of success. And obviously that goes into part four, which is tracking, making sure that the tracking is set up 
and ready to go before you launch the piece and making sure that it's tracking the right things so that you know what you're actually talking about. One of my first clients didn't set, have the tracking set up properly and I had to go back in and figure out what the real uh, conversion rate was based on my affiliate links that I was using to track purchases because the person compiling their uh, sale information had drastically underestimated or had, had drastically underrated the amount of conversions that my copy was getting. And so we were having a heated conversation about how my copy wasn't working when in reality it was just bad tracking and bad data gathering. So make sure you know exactly what you're talking about when you're talking about tracking and when you're saying, okay, I need this to fire right here. I need this pixel to fire right here because that means that the person bought my product and now they're on this page or whatever it happens to be. Or I need this affiliate link so that I know when people buy and I can track it myself. Look into learning a little bit about tracking. As a copywriter, it's your bread and butter to understand what the data is telling you. And last, here are some of my final thoughts on the writing process that I can give you guys. First one is, this is my process. You don't have to copy it. You don't even have to take any of it. You should create your own process. However, you must create your own process. Do not do this type of stuff without a process. I say that from experience. I tried to do this copywriting thing without a process for a lot longer than I would like to admit. And what it results in is inconsistent results. It results in inconsistent writing. Sometimes it would take me five days to write an entire package. Other, day, other times it would take me eight weeks because I didn't have a process to go through. Now that I have one, my stuff is pretty consistent I can, and I can knock things out really quickly. But I had to make it. And if I didn't make it, then I would still be spinning my wheels in a lot of places and I wouldn't be getting the results that I get now. So make your process. You must create your process. Next thing. So your niche and your specialty and your industry is going to dictate what your process looks like. If you are in the financial niche, then you are going to be very research heavy. If your specialty is in video sales letters, you're going to want to do research on other videos that have been emotionally compelling so that you know how to visually orient your stuff also with the text or with the script itself. If your industry is one where you have to speak in a specific way, then a lot of the buyer information you're going to want to look at needs to be around that way of speaking. Your niche, your specialty, your industry will dictate what your process looks like. Questionnaires. I've given you a couple questionnaires either in the Q&As or in the Facebook group, but one of the things I want you guys to do is craft your own questionnaire that you can send to your client before you start working because these are the questions that are important to you as a writer to know about the product and about your client and about the marketplace before you start working. Your questionnaires are a reflection of what your work is going to be like. It's one of the first things your client sees from you. So a good questionnaire is a good first impression, but it also has to be customized to you. You can't take my questionnaire and use it for your own because some of the questions might not make sense to you or you might not need that information until you do certain amounts of research, whatever it happens to be, because your process is your own. I would also highly, highly, highly recommend getting a really good questionnaire written out and sent to every single one of your new clients to, for them to fill out. The next part is testimonials and referrals. This is part of the process. Getting a testimonial from your client and getting a referrals or multiple referrals from your client should be built into your process. It should be part of the process. If you deliver the copy, then on the date of delivery, you can ask for a referral based on your project that you work together with. Now, some of them might say, yeah, I'd be happy to give you referrals, but first I want to see how the copy works. You, you go, okay, great, fine. Um, that's perfectly understandable. I will follow up with you after the day of the launch, or I will follow up with you in a week after we see how it's going. Whatever it happens to be, put it in the process that you're creating. Otherwise, it's not going to get done. Referrals are 100% for you. So they do nothing for your client, which means you have to push for them. Testimonials do nothing for your client. They do everything for you, so you have to push for them. 
build it into the process or otherwise you're going to forget about it and your client sure as shit is not going to give you that any of them without asking. Even your best clients will very rarely give you a testimonial unless you specifically ask for one. Simply because it's not on their radar. It's not their fault. It's just not on their radar. It's not important to them because it doesn't do anything for them. The next thing is, and the reason I bolded it and capitalized it is because you should never stop improving your process. You're going to learn every day. If you stay a copywriter, if you choose to be a copywriter as your career or you choose to be a copywriter as your uh, hobby, whatever it happens to be, you should never stop improving. And that means you will never stop improving your process. I always keep improving my process. It might end up becoming five steps. Maybe I'll do more research in here. Maybe I'm going to find new stuff to look at. Maybe even the big four might turn into the big five. Who knows? I'm always going to be improving my process because that makes me a better writer and it makes me way more valuable as a copywriter because if a copywriter is constantly improving their skills, then the client can rest assured that they're going to do the best work possible for their piece. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is outsourcing. When you look at this process, you probably see a couple things in here that you could potentially outsource. Things like the initial product scrub. Maybe you have somebody else go through the product and tell you what is in there. Okay, maybe. The target market, the research, the primal desire stuff, the market awareness, the market sophistication. All of this research could probably be done by someone else. Maybe even the client interviews, the prospect interviews, the focus groups, the external research, all that kind of stuff. I am not going to tell you not to outsource things. However, I will tell you that each of these pieces builds on itself and your understanding of each piece and awareness of each piece will dictate how good it is. Which means if you outsource your research and the researcher does 80% of the job that you would normally do for research, they didn't dig too deep into demographics, so they know that Susie is 45 years old and she lives in the Mountain West but they don't know that Susie is 47 years old with two kids living in Colorado. That's the difference, that's the 80%. So if you can find a great researcher who does 110%, does better stuff than you, awesome, great. But if you can't, be very wary of outsourcing all of this stuff because it is mission critical. And specifically on the research, what I'm talking about here because I've seen a lot of threads on Facebook and in forums about outsourcing research and I'm not a fan, but the, you know, even the product, you want to go through the product. You want to find those features. You want to turn them into fascinations yourself. You want to find what the testimonials are yourself, the reviews, the stories, because that's going to help you build the whole thing. It's going to help you have this conversation. That's going to help you choose what template based on your market awareness, right? If you're using a template for a level one awareness, but you're at a level three and you didn't realize that because the person didn't do the right research, then you're screwing up what you can do. Gather and organize, organizing your own stuff so that you know where it is rather than letting somebody else organize it. You spend more time looking for it than you do writing. I'm not a big fan of outsourcing any of these tasks, but if you think that you can find someone to do it better than you that will help you write better, then I would say go for it. But just be wary that each piece builds off of itself. And that, everyone, is my process, my, my way of doing things. I would highly suggest you build your own process. Hopefully this was valuable for you. And if you have any questions, come to the Q&A calls on Wednesday mornings. Love to answer any questions you have on this. But until then, have a great day.